Welcome to the Develop Yourself podcast, where we teach you everything you need to land your first job as a software developer by learning to develop yourself, your skills, your network, and more. I'm Brian, your host. All right, today I got Matt Cascardi, friend of mine, software developer, a person who actually helped me out really early on in my career. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about how he started his own business, freelancing, origin story, how he got into software. But before we get into that, when I was first starting to code, I actually, I think I went on Facebook or something like that. And I just put up a post like, who can like help me code something yep, like that. You put you it on Facebook and on and then, Twitter. Yeah. Yep. Oh, whoa, damn, damn, that's crazy. And you were like the person that reached out. I hadn't spoken to you in a while or even really knew you were in software. That's so mad. I'm curious, like, first of all, like, what are you working on now? What are you doing? Sure. Uh, I'm working on um, a WordPress multi-site instance right now uh, for an education company called Stride or K-12. And all of the public schools uh, and these are tuition-free online schools uh, that they run um, and they support uh, all have their own sites. And so we have about 65 or so live sites uh, now that are migrated from the previous platform, but these are all um, schools, uh, which are, you know, uh, Stride's customers. Uh, and, and that's really who Very we support. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. How long, how long have you been like coding for in general? Like when I met you, mm-hmm. you were already kind of into your career, it felt like. Yeah. How long in total have you been coding? I have been coding since about 2008. Uh, seriously. Wow. You know, 2008, 2009 nice. is when I, kind of peg it because uh, that's when I uh, really focused on that in most of my spare time. And what I didn't know, I learned. I want to interrupt really quickly to let you know that this is the last week to get a discount at Parsity. If you're serious about joining, go down to the show notes. There's links to all sorts of free stuff, as well as a link to schedule a quick chat with me if you want to learn more about Parsity. Anyway, back to our regularly scheduled programming. And yeah, I'm curious like about that too. Like how did, how did you learn? You're, you're self-taught completely, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really true. Now it doesn't mean that I, uh, you know, I went to school and I studied psychology and the, the, a lot of the skills and the things I learned there, I find really useful in web development and also in the things that it does for people or the way that customers come in. Uh, user behavior is super important in understanding web uh, and why we need to develop certain things and what and what works uh, and understanding um, traffic and statistics, you know, and analytics around that uh, is super helpful to have uh, those educational things yeah. to, to bring in. But yeah, classically, I'm not um, an edu- you know, uh, engineer. Uh, or have not gone to technical college or anything like some people may. That's a cool. You, you bring up like the site psychology aspect of like working on the web and customers. I think a lot of people take that for granted. They don't think about, yeah. Oh, that actually is a really helpful I would, like mental model to have yeah. when you're working on the web. I would say some of the most important things you can know uh, after the programming part of it is really turning around and looking at it from the user's perspective and looking at all of your users and thinking about that. Um, Because the whole reason we want to increase conversion rates, the whole reason we want our websites to load faster or appear more intuitive uh, to navigate or to uh, guide people into what we want them to do. Before before we get too deep into the freelance, I'm sure the people that are listening are mostly new to coding, really want to learn specifically about that. I want to kind of go further in, like you learned to code, but what did you like start learning to be able to get to a freelance position? Okay. Like, can you kind of take me down? Yeah. What did you learn? So how'd you learn it? And then what told you, Hey, I got enough, I yeah. have enough knowledge at this point. Step to one for it. was to set something up for myself. All I object, well, my first objective was to get WordPress and figure out how to install it. That's it. Because when you have one of those, you have a little baby, you have something you can take and clone for somebody else. So now, you know, you kind of needed another person to build something for. So you need two things, like 
I want to know how to set up the system. So if somebody asks me for it, I could do it. And then the second part of that is like, I need some project to do uh, and, yeah, and kind of right. build something for them. But like what they want is part of the whole uh, part, the, the entire project, uh, I'd say. So build um, sites for people for free. And I built about five yeah. or 10 pilot, you know, um, and that became a portfolio. Um, as long as you have the links to those sites and they're up, uh, it's a link that you can use to send people if they ever ask you, like, do you have something I can see already that you've done? That's pretty much what they're going to yeah. ask. Um, and that is your pitch. And so for the sites that you've built, like, so I generally tell like boot camp grads that, or people that are trying to get into the industry, like your portfolio doesn't matter so much, but as a freelancer, your portfolio yeah. is super important, uh -huh. right? Because that's what all your clients sure. see. So that's like an important distinction, I think, for people listening. But as a, as a web developer now, like just your last couple of jobs, has anybody asked to see your portfolio? Uh, like your no, are they, I, I want to tell them about the companies I worked for. Yeah, and, right. and those are yeah, longer exactly. term, you know, positions that I've held. So it, it kind of has a different, uh, your resume kind of looks different. It doesn't look like sure. uh, all the people you've been with, you know, or hopefully I think it's a, I think it's a, a red flag if you see kind of too many prior positions. I'm talking like within a year or less, uh, a two yeah. to three year yeah. stint. Um, I have. A couple long stints under my belt for sure. Um, tech does move kind of fast, uh, but when you're contracting or when you're uh, working contracts for other businesses, you know they do tend to end or uh, you tend to move positions or for whatever reason. But you you um, really want to talk about your your successes and your experiences. And your your experiences within those teams at different times more than you do uh, name drop, you know, like on your resume. Uh, I feel like they, yeah, in the interview yeah. process, uh, I do feel like there is kind of an elitism. Uh, so you are going to want to name sure. drop uh, for sure uh, mm -hmm. uh, at the front, at the forefront. Um, so for people freelancing versus people uh, interviewing, I think this is a two different approaches. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make that distinction because people get so hung up on the portfolio thing. I'm like, you know, yeah, as a freelancer, for sure, do it. So it, what, So you started with WordPress. Mm -hmm. Would you still suggest, like if you're starting off right now, what would you be using potentially to build websites? Do you still use WordPress? What would you suggest uh, uh, you start with? I'm, I'm so biased. I feel like I can't honestly answer yeah. that question because uh, sure. I, I, WordPress is a very large, uh, you know, dominant uh you know, uh, mainstay like in the CMS world, but it is on the way out. It is on. It is fr it is a little bit past its peak in terms of the other frameworks uh, that are moving forward. Headless CMSs mostly are are eclipsing um, and taking over more of that market share from WordPress. But there's so much mm -hmm. architecture built around WordPress, anyways, that it's an open system. It's an open platform. It's pretty much a DIY person's you know dream it, and that's how I that's how I feel about it because okay. if you want to use WordPress to use the basic editor define a, a few custom themes and like leave it at that you can do that if you want to start with an absolute white page you can do everything uh, if you want to code it yourself and anywhere okay. in between. And if you want to find a plugin, yeah. you can find a good plugin to use, or you can write your own plugin, you know? And it's like, it's kind of uh, open space for like, if you want to roll your own, you could do that. Um, it all, to me, is more appealing to roll your own than to take something off the box. But I, I, I will say that half of the time on a project, if you're starting off with a new project, what you want to do is look for something out of the box that's about eighty percent of what they initially had in them had in mind, and then yeah, you really take point. that the next the last twenty percent to tailor it for them. 
Uh, but don't get too hung up on writing it all from scratch because you can. Yeah. Yeah, that's a super good point as well. I think too many people get caught up like, oh, is this cheating or something? And you got to think, what does the customer really want? Like, they don't care really what you use or if you've yeah. got a yeah. template. You're there to put the uh, how? different pieces. You're there to put the pieces together. Yeah, right. Yeah. How did, if, how did you get to your first customer? One of the early, early ones I had was uh, for somebody who was making art. And I have some of these paintings uh in the background here uh still have them and it's dated 08 matter of fact so um oh, that okay. was one of the first like uh physical checks i got from a client that m uh, my other partner and i pitched um pitched him on a website for his art and got like a check for 800 dollars uh, after wow. you know on a live pitch in a room with this guy that was the first time that that happened um, now the 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 partner I was with was extremely uh, effective in uh, closing the sale and 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 uh, and that kind of thing. So there was a lot to learn for me That's to helpful. learn about that too. Um, actually, one of the one of the jobs I had uh, before was actually telemarketing, and telemarketing oh, was something that, that sure really that helped handy, me right? uh, in in learning how to pitch uh, people in general. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, learning the art of sales. Like I, I did a freelance. I did a quite a lot of freelance with one guy for a while. He didn't know how to code super well, but he was great at sales. And he'd get all these contracts, and he'd subcontract me. So I was like always helping him out. And I did like, like I don't know, half a dozen over a year for him. Mm -hmm. And it was really cool. But it showed me that learning the art of sales is super important. If you were doing this again now, mm -hmm. trying to get customers with like being on social media and that being such a powerful tool, would you? use the same strategy or do you think you'd do something different i would do a lot of it the same well i'm i'm thinking about not knowing how to code but actually if i was the engineer i am today uh and i went back uh what i would do is start by finding out who's around you uh because the best thing you could use is not to say that you could do everything yourself but you know somebody who can. If I need business cards or I need a new press kit or something, I don't need to then learn how to make press kits. I need somebody who makes press kits to know that if I get a client, I can get the work done for them that I need rather than being having to only sell them on something I can accomplish. Uh, so knowing who's around you, if it's somebody that's in... um design if it's anybody that's in if it's if you're more of an engineer usually you need somebody who's more outgoing to be a client uh project you know representative for you but if you're more of a marketer and you're more into mm -hmm. the excitement of marketing and selling people on things you know maybe you need a few other back office people to help you uh set up your business and your uh your you know, all of your support. Those are just ideas. Uh, but I would mm -hmm. say start with that and you'll find out because it will evolve along the way. We've had different partners at different times. At sometimes you're a fit to work with somebody. At sometimes you're just not a fit to work with them at that time. Uh, and that, yeah. that happened a lot uh, throughout those years. So what do you say to people that are like, they're learning to code, they go to a boot camp, they go to somewhere like Parsity or something like that. They get out, they know, Pretty, how to code pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, at what point, they never feel ready. Like, how do you just start? Like, or is there some litmus test to say, okay, now you can freelance and charge money? You have to try. Uh, you, yeah. can't catch, you can't catch a fish without having your line in the water. So I, I, I think at, I like the, at the point that you are actually looking at or trying to send people a, a proposal generating proposals is hard at the in the beginning i know that was one of the biggest things i struggled with was invoicing people just because um you definitely wanted to get paid on how much you pitched them um, but you have to justify it every time you send them a bill like uh so you have to have oh. done the work and and kind of documented it all then 
once they kind of felt like it was delivered, then you could send them the bill. And I'll tell you, being honest, that's not fair for developers. Uh, developers work like a, a partner. So really what you should do in the at the bare minimum is get 50% up front. Because it takes your time oh. and energy to go ahead and work with that person throughout the project during that whole time. You're taking on risk too, just as much as them. Uh, you know, so you need to position yourself a bit better on the on the on the lead in to um say, hey, if we're gonna do a fifteen hundred dollar project with you, you know, I need to have five hundred just to get started. Somewhere along the lines How, where you... they really feel like uh you're getting you're feeling like you're getting paid along the way. Do you charge by the hour typically, or do you charge by the project? I would only so, charge. Why? I would only charge by the hour if it's something I can do continuously that I know how to do. Those projects work very well by the hour because you know how much you can do and how fast you can do it. I would charge on a project based on loose requirements. Um, or putting a okay. number of different things together. They're not all the same. Uh, so it's hard to really break down a project that has um, more than just producing a lot of one thing or doing a lot of the same thing for somebody. Um, if you've got... That makes sense. Yeah, if you've got, um, you know, 150 pages to build, you're going to want to make sure you account for all of that and and add in the bit of overhead that's going to go into it. But if you're doing a brand or you're doing a new design um, and build for somebody, and you're doing a bit of that creative work too, I really push uh, more towards the project basis because you're going to get what they can afford a, a little bit better dialed in. I think you're going to match their expectations in terms of uh, what they paid for versus what they got. Gotcha. That that makes okay. That's kind of the way I've like just done it too. The few times I've done. And here's an interesting one too. I'm sure people are gonna want to know this. How like how do you just know what to charge? Like you have like a matrix. So mm -hmm. okay, you want a website, a static site with mm -hmm. these many pages of the charge. Yep. You, you have to set whatever. your minimum price, and you have to set your minimum price because you have to start talking at that point. That's your starting point with mm -hmm. people whenever they ask you for an off the cuff estimate. You give them the base price. Uh, and, he, and, and if, yeah, if okay. that doesn't turn them away, then you're fine. Like if, if right? But if it does turn <laughs> them away, you don't yeah. care. Uh, because go ahead and, and go yeah. out and get something else for less. And I've had clients do that to me. You know, that was yep. kind of offensive. But at the same time, I knew that was right. <laughs> like that I wasn't going to do work for less than a certain amount because to me, I've put in the effort and uh, and that's what it's worth. So. You know, have to know that, uh, tell people, give them something that they can just get started with and see if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just to get started, it's going to be $850 or whatever. Uh, and I heard mm -hmm. somebody else on the phone in, in a store one time talking to somebody, asking them the same type of question. And he said, yeah. you shouldn't charge any less for 15, uh, than $500 for a website. Or if they are, it better be all perfect uh it's a bare minimum site they give you exactly what you need you hardly do any work yourself mm -hmm. that's kind of all if other than that it's everything is extra if they want different pages it's going to be extra if they want different photos it's going to be extra if they want different colors everything is extra after that yeah, that was like that, that was his really advice to somebody advice. just getting started really good. you know it's really good uh I'm curious what you think about this. So people are freaking out over AI taking jobs. Yeah. But also people might think, why do you need a freelancer if you have like Webflow or, you know, what are the many other low code slash no code tools? Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to that? Because it's it's obvious they haven't taken away the need for people making sites. But yeah, what's your take on that? Yeah. Uh, AI is new for sure. But there's an age old uh, classic struggle between what computers can do and what humans could do and the classic struggle is this um humans can do two types of work they can do uh logical sequential work 
um, and looking up references and gathering information and kind of doing that. And then they can do this creative thinking and creative problem solving thing. And what we've done is we've invented computers to do the uh, logical sequential work way faster than we can do. And the, the premise of that is that it gives us more time to do the creative work, to do maybe what we call the interesting stuff or, you know, the free thinking. But we have yet to be able to really, you know, either get computers to do that very well. Uh, but really, the joy is that we would get to do more of that and less of the, uh, you know, processing work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, we we actually end up, um, you know, entrenching ourselves more in the computer world by being a part of it, uh, and not just and That's not ju not just using it to uh, take our work away, uh, but we actually end up doing more work uh, and and doing more of it. Uh, so it's just interesting. It is. Yeah, it's funny. Like the more things we add also it seems like software and maybe this is my own inexperience you know uh, it's getting more complex there's more systems to interact oh, with yeah. things are easier to deploy but there's more and more systems there's more complexity and you get ai and it makes it to have another tool to leverage it makes now everything really ambiguous it's done this for people yeah. where they won't know if a video is fake or real and they won't oh yeah right how would you know without mm -hmm. like now you're totally unsure Right now, there's now there's companies making detection software, so it's spawning more industries that now can can do that, which is yeah. interesting. So, what AI has done is it's exploded the content world. Um, so, yeah. the content world is now really dominated by uh, industrial strength content creation engines and professionals. So, there's a whole suite yeah. of tools meant for content creation professionals who are out there representing brands, um, who are out there, you know, being the front end um, of a lot of these brands and these businesses and people with a hope and a dream feel as if that brand is someone is there, the owners are out there with their phone, you know, taking selfies, but there's a lot of other people working behind the scenes professionals working behind the scenes so really to get a a foothold in the content game and the social media game you really got to be connected to the content creator uh branch of this uh, of this whole industry um uh, other than that really i would say focus on your business on your core business focus on how your process is being sold and where your sales are coming from, understanding your your channels, like we call it your lead channels or your different sources. Mm -hmm. um, there's word of mouth, you know, there's a billboard, there's online and there's in store, right? There's all these different channels. Um, we focus on online a lot because we can really streamline that and really systematize sales on a big scale. And that's the revolution that it is. But if you have any kind of a reputation you're probably going to want to look more to your local city, state, county, you know, to look for your core customer base Maybe. if you feel like that's your strength. Um, and if you're selling software as a service, then, you know, work that brand, work that logo, work that copy, work all of that messaging that you want to put in front of your customers. Man, that's that's really good, dude. That's really smart advice. I think, like me especially, I tend to, you know, overly focus perhaps on the internet. And uh, there's a student at Parsity looking for some freelance jobs, and he was going around his local like town, and he went to a barbecue spot. And he's like, "Hey, your website sucks. Let me build it for you." And they like knew him as a customer. And said, "Oh yeah, let's do it." Right. And I thought that interaction right. just wouldn't I, take I, place if you were a stranger online. Happen? Nope, it wouldn't because that person was a customer. He had his already he was already credible right with them yeah. as a person it's the personal rapport of it that also t comes into play because um nowadays there's a bunch of people who are uh out there uh selling services so if you're going out looking for something you're gonna find 
uh, a lot of you honestly um there's a real sea of engineers and developers out there looking for work and everyone knows that you need it so um but yeah. but reaching out to somebody and saying hey i think i can help you is even right. it's a better pitch honestly Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it worked out for him. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe it'll translate to something. If nothing else, it gives him some nice, credible work experience. Yeah. I've done trade arrangements with some of my other um, freelancing uh, clients. So you went from freelancing into a full time job at a corporation for a company. Um, doing that transfer, what was your interview process like? And what are some tips, maybe? Because you were kind of recently on the job market. Yeah. What can you tell people about what they should expect and how to best prepare? Yeah. After I had kind of gained a bit of ground on my freelancing career, somebody I worked with before actually passed me a reference for this job opening. Uh, and I took the interview. And uh, essentially, uh, I had the experience that they were looking for in a um entry level developer at 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 a corporate level which was the first time I'd ever had a full time salary job um the backstory on that team was they had built a migration of their current website over to WordPress but they hadn't completed it and the uh, director the lead on that team left so what they did need was somebody with WordPress experience who could come in and help finish out the project uh, and actually and actually launch the WordPress migration. Um, so I joined that team and then finished out that project. Um, and that became my new team uh, there. Uh, so the interview process was a, first an interview with the other engineer on the team who would become my direct manager. And then a panel. So there was a panel of three oh, other yeah. interviews, yeah. Uh, uh, three other developers who were on the team. Um, so then they got a round, and then I think I got another round with someone higher up. Um, and that was and and the coding interview was a back end coding challenge uh, in WordPress. So I came in for this on site oh. interview. I did three rounds. I did a coding challenge, and then I left. So it was all in one. Any data structures and algorithms? No. Any DSA mm -mm. stuff? No, this was a different... That's no, what I thought. No, it really wasn't. Um, until later, until recently, I've uh, been through the job search, and uh, there is a lot of more uh, familiarity that companies have with interviewing. And the interviewing process for engineers has gotten really geared towards doing online coding challenges, doing live coding challenges. Uh, as a part of the series of interviews that you usually face. Yeah. So it could be a first right. round type of live coding interview, or it could be a second round uh, live coding interview. If they want to see your skills after they've already talked to you and kind of gotten a general sense of your knowledge. Yeah. How And so that's interesting because people, one, think that like, they have this Google style interview in their head that every company like we traverse this binary tree. And one, you're saying that was not your interview experience in general. It is it in it, it, it is in in some of the larger uh, tech companies. So in the fang oh, yeah, in the sure. fang group and in the um in the tech space, they definitely gear towards that kind of interview more. Um but a lot of it really translates to, can, do you have what they need? Can you solve their problem? And in that interview at Checkpoint, they were specifically looking for somebody to solve their problem. If they start asking you about their problem in the interview, like mm -hmm. you know that they're interested and they think you could fit that position for what they need. That's a good sign okay. uh, that they are interested in you as well rather than just having a rote interview process, maybe. Because sometimes I feel companies run through a lot of candidates and just are maybe hiring for depth or some other team is, you know, has an open rec. Uh, it, at, at a larger company, they really don't have as much of a interest in uh, 
signing somebody on like uh, as urgently as somebody who's maybe looking to fill a crucial role. So the interviews are all different. All of the job, you mm -hmm. know, companies are different. Hiring managers are different. And big takeaway from that is you can't really generalize. And every situation is kind of unique. It's a pretty good point. I've spoken with a ton of developers and I do see some like patterns for sure. But you're right. It's like every company has their own flavor. Everybody's trying to do it better or different than the other one. Like I'm guilty of this too. Like, oh, I'm going to make our interview process like this for our specific need or something like that. And it makes it hard to study. How would you, like, what would you tell people that are trying to study yeah. for interviews? Like, I would say look at job descriptions. Like... So uh, I got some coaching from some outplacement uh, resources. And one of the things they set me up with was an Excel sheet. And I had for every company I was applying for, I took the job title, pasted in there, their main contact, pasted in the next row, then their the job description itself. So I started saving job descriptions from listings that I applied to. Um, and okay. that was super helpful because you start to be able to see a job description that looks good for you versus mm -hmm. trying to get yourself, uh, you know, credibility on like what their, what the job description is. I feel like when you know, you, you start to get that as you go through the interview process, the ones that start to look more promising it will help you learn which job descriptions look right for you. It's an interesting technique. I like that. Did you make, did you, you said someone else, like you're part of a program. Or well, like a, yeah, the out person, the outplacement. Yeah. The outplacement. Um, so basically like an HR coach, um, uh, a career coach type of person. I've worked with a couple career coach type people. So yeah. um, that really helped me instead of just focusing on engineering skill and proving that i can code in all the different frameworks right and having that yeah. whole litmus that whole laundry list of coding frameworks on my resume was great because i could say i've done things in those frameworks at a company that's pretty much what it's right, used yeah. for uh you want to make sure mm -hmm. that anything on your resume is something you can say that you've done for somebody else in a in in a context you know um, for me, I'm very senior, so on a production scale at, like, a large company, um, that shows that I really know how to use that thing. Um, but even if you've yeah. done it for a client, um, one, of the, one of the good interviews I had, um, somebody said, I can tell you really know all the stuff you put on your resume. Half of the people I interview, uh, they can't answer, answer a couple simple questions about it, and yet they claim they know this stuff. And I just thought that was so interesting. Yeah, that's a dangerous move. Yeah. yeah. So putting the laundry list of like half all the programming languages and being a DevOps shop, it's dangerous move. Yeah. It is, but I fell into that exact same trap myself. So I understand. We all, I think, common. Yeah, I've done it too. We, you think more is better. And uh, sometimes it can be. I mean, that's, that's the thing is, it's really hard to get like a single approach that works for everybody. Hey, if um, anyone you know has had a good experience with a company that did some work, you know, with an agency or um, somebody, look them up and see if they have any openings. There might be a lot less there to look for, but you never know. There might be some niche companies, some small companies around. And go poke and see if they have job openings listed anywhere. I like your whole approach, like from freelancing to like job hunting, it's like a much more grassroots approach that most people don't do. And one that's not often just talked about online, mm -hmm. people always like the job board here, go here, here's how to optimize LinkedIn. Like I do that a lot, but you're, you got a really good point. Like use your local network yeah. and make those connections. Cause that's often going to be the things that aren't posted on LinkedIn because a lot of companies Correct. don't have the budget to post there and they're just looking for referrals anyway. So you might know some guy that you worked with in the past at some completely different uh, type of work that could actually help you out. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. Hey, I mean, this has been really cool to hear and I appreciate all the information and like wisdom you've shared here. I've, I've learned quite a lot too. And I know this is going to help a lot of other people out there that want to potentially get into networking. Any last words before we head out? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, so thank you for having me on. 
And absolutely, yeah, pretty much my 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 main message is that if you are interested and you want to learn, go ahead and look for those resources because they're out there. And so if you want to learn how to code something, read the documentation. If you want to learn how to market, uh, go to a marketing school and look for their free resources. Start wherever you're at and just get curious about it and just uh, get into it because that's really the the best part about doing something you love uh, and, and doing a good job at that feels really good. And that, like, I think gives you the momentum you need to keep going through the hard times and all of the problems that go wrong that, of course, you know, are going to happen. For sure. Man, that's super good advice, man. Thank you so much. Thanks again, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, bro. That'll do it for today's episode of the Develop Yourself podcast. To learn more about becoming a software engineer with us, then check out Parsity.io. If you're not quite ready for that, then jump into our dev30.xyz program, which is 30 days of working on your mindset, habits, and JavaScript skills. Totally worth it. See you next week.